lawmakers could set new rules for THC seltzers sold in Connecticut stores. That headline really caught my eye because I'm I'm on the board of a um, hemp drink called Dope Drink, and uh, I'm following that hemp beverage sector very closely. So Connecticut had a loophole in their law, and I'll just read you the article. Try to quickly. I hate reading articles, but. All right, Stu Leonard's Wines and Spirits of Norwalk, Danbury, and Newington started stocking the shelves with THC beverages in September 2023. The canned THC tonics pictured in the article um, at the Norwalk location come in flavors like lemon lavender, grapefruit rosemary, and blood orange cardamom. Callan Ozanic, Hearst, Connecticut Media Group. Oh, that's who did the picture. THC seltzers can get you high, but Connecticut lawmakers are poised to put them in a category all their own, distinct from every other product that contains THC. Connecticut will likely create a separate system of taxation of THC seltzers with different rules than governing cannabis products, so infused beverages can remain in package stores. Reno... Farrah Reese, owner of Affinity Grow in Portland, is one of only six operational cannabis growers in Connecticut. He said he's heard from cannabis, food and beverage manufacturer, retailers, and cultivators, and nobody wants the beverage alcohol industry selling cannabis products. Connecticut's market is still young, and many businesses are still in the process of opening. It doesn't make sense to give away the beverage sales in advance of the food and beverage manufacturers becoming operational. He said, especially since the package stores will purchase THC beverages from outside the program. Should the bill pass in its most recent form, the state will effectively create four categories of products with THC, each with their own set of regulations. Cannabis products may only be grown, produced, and tested in Connecticut, so that's cannabis, not hemp, and they may only be sold by licensed legal retailers and medical cannabis dispensaries. Cannabis products are subject to both state and local taxes, in part dependent on how potent they are. Homegrown cannabis is legal, but limited to six plants, three mature and three immature grown indoors. High THC hemp products are derived from plants with THC concentration lower than 0.3% by dry weight, but have been chemically altered to be more potent. THC-infused beverages would be in their own category, sold in package stores or licensed cannabis retailers, not in supermarkets, restaurants, or bars, and would contain no more than 3 milligrams of THC per can. By contrast, a cannabis gummy contains 5 milligrams of THC. Should the law pass, there would also be a dollar per package assessment to the state split by the wholesaler and the retailer. All of that money would go, at least right now, under the bill to the DCP enforcement account. State Representative Michael D. Agostino, a Democrat from Hamden, he's the chairman of the legislature's general law committee. There are currently 10 Connecticut companies with cannabis, food, and beverage manufacturing licenses, only three of which are final. But THC seltzers, unlike legal cannabis products, could be manufactured anywhere, derived from hemp grown outside of Connecticut, and tested at any lab in the U.S., though the test results will be published and available online. Rather than creating something from whole cloth, we are shoehorning it into our existing liquor statutes, which makes the regulation a bit easier and, frankly, more robust, Diagostino said. We want to make sure that the sales are regulated and controlled, and we want to make sure we've got a group of retailers who we know can oversee the sales, which makes it easy for us to oversee the sales so the liquor stores were a natural fit for that. They're the ones who proposed this were the, and were the main backers of it. Larry Caffaro, president of the Trade Association Wine and Spirits Wholesalers of Connecticut, said his goal was to keep the sale of THC beverages controlled. What we saw was a product being introduced to the market with no regulation whatsoever. It's like the wild, wild west, he said. What we called for is regulation, at least, as to age and venue. Though the cannabis industry spoke vociferously against the proposal, Ben Zax, president of cannabis retailer Fine Fettle, said THC seltzers make up a tiny portion of their sales. We hope to see the licenses of the food and beverage manufacturers succeed, but it's not been the main priority of our business. He said, we're looking to see how we can best bring the drinks, or not, to the consumer. 
By contrast, warehouse beverage company, makers of Wink THC seltzer, told the legislature in testimony that they expect more than 32 million cans of THC seltzer to be sold annually in Connecticut, which at $5 per can, which mean, would mean more than $163 million in sales. Steve Palaskas, owner of Connecticut Valley Brewing in South Windsor, told the legislature his company needs the sale of THC seltzers to survive. My business needs this product because it's the extra revenue generated that keeps all 45 men and women employed, he said. D'Agostino, who initially proposed keeping all legal THC products sold by licensed shops, said the cannabis retailers he's spoken to do not view the drinks as competing with their product lines. They don't seem to want to carry the drinks, which is understandable. He said there's a shelf space and an expiration date cost to all those products, and the customers who want flour are buying flour. The customers who want vapes are buying vapes, and they're not going to lose those customers to a 3% THC drink, so they don't have an issue with it. THC seltzers are legal because of the 2018 federal farm bill that legalized hemp and CBD. That bill is overdue for reauthorization, and several attorneys general, including Connecticut Attorney General William Tong, have signed on to a letter asking Congress to close what they see as a loophole allowing the sale of THC products like these seltzers. That bill made legal THC products made from hemp, and whatever the state legislature does, if that federal law changes, THC seltzers could become illegal. These products, because they're legal federally, we can't ban them, Diagostino said. For a Congress that is so opposed to cannabis legalization to allow what is a massive loophole that has allowed all these THC products to be out there, I'm stunned they haven't closed that loophole. If that loophole does get closed at the federal level, state law would have to change yet again to allow the sale of THC seltzers. I'm not sure how long lived the seltzer thing will be, quite frankly, because if they close that loophole, then we would have to say, okay, the only way you can sell these drinks in Connecticut is to have solely Connecticut manufacturing facilities established. That's the rule. So we're back to the THC uh, cannabis versus hemp situation. Hmm. <laughs> so what say you? This so uh, to me, the synopsis is this. Connecticut has the package stores selling cannabis drinks. They want to keep doing it. Half the cannabis people are like, fine, let them do it. It's only 3%. Half the cannabis people are like, hey, they shouldn't be allowed to do that. We had to pay all this money for these licenses. And we've got, you know, we've got to protect the people that have the manufacturing licenses because these canned drinks or any of these seltzer drinks can be produced anywhere and brought into Connecticut. So it's sort of cannibalizing our own um, cannabis root world. So the question is, how much sense does this make? Is it good or bad? I mean, this, I mean, it, it, it sounds to me like they're going to turn uh, Connecticut into Minnesota. Is it good or bad? I mean... I I mean, I think all of that is still yet to be seen because we're still watching Minnesota, uh, Minnesota's situation play out. Um, but like Minnesota is like the beverage capital. And it sounds to me, it sounds to me too, though, that like Connecticut is trying to have it more restrictive than how, than how, uh, than, than how Minnesota has it is like, you can, you can sell your THC beverages in Minnesota in like regular stores. They don't have to be uh, cannabis based stores. So, but but Connecticut is saying, hey, we're going to, you know. I, I mean, look, we have problems. We have overregulation mm -hmm. of psychotropic cannabinoids that are derived from cannabis plants. And we have underregulation of psychotropic cannabinoids that are derived from hemp plants. We also have the cost of burdensome compliance with regulated track and trace supply chains for cannabis operators. And then we have meh. When it comes yeah. to hemp products. Right. And so we need to find a set of regulations that regulates according to what gets people high and what doesn't and lower the cost and burden of the regulated industry and increase the consumer safety, potency restrictions and quality concerns of underregulated hemp. Mm -hmm. And what's great about hemp products is that we are seeing them in stores, CPG establishments, there's a normalization that's occurring there that's great. What's not great about it is that there are markets 
where age restricted products are probably not being age restricted and where things that are far too potent are being sold. And I think the, the, that there's going to be some sort of tragedy and it's going to be around something that is orally ingested and somebody's going to lose their life. And then lawmakers are going to feel the need to overcompensate. Mm -hmm. We've been waiting for changes since the 2008 farm bill. If you talk to lobbyists, they will tell you that the changes is going to happen this year. I don't think that's the truth. I've talked to some of the brightest minds in, in, in hemp and it's going to happen the year after. In the meantime, what we know about enterprising entrepreneurs is they often live in the loopholes, whether those are tax loopholes or regulatory loopholes. Jamie and I had a nice conversation uh, offline a few weeks ago about, in general, beverages and uh, beverages with hemp cannab hemp derived cannabinoids in them. I think I think it's an exciting category. I'm biased because I've been working a little bit on one, but I'm also biased because I think that. Many of us are relics of a bygone era, and I don't know that two or three generations from now, people are going to say, yep, I want to break up my cannabis and roll it into a little stick and look for a lighter and puff a bunch of clouds and smoke that might be offensive to some people who don't smoke. And so I think beverages is going to be here to stay. I think it's been slower to grow than those who have been evangelical about it. Clearly, some people saw the future way in advance, like Julian Cohen, of uh you know of of canopy uh, uh canopy growth and and and, uh, and constellation I think it was before that but gosh how convenient is a beverage and so with fast acting cannabinoids uh with quick onset and I, I just don't see how this category doesn't continue to grow it's single digit within the regulated space we don't have I don't think the statistics for every privately held hemp derived cannabis beverage company that's selling through in the United States. But I think that in markets where we see alcohol consumption going down and cannabis consumption going up, these things are really the crossover product and I'm excited about it. Dr. Mark, this is, this okay. is, this is all up your alley right here. Now Dr. Mark. Some, yeah. Okay. Now for some reality. Drop the hammer. I'm yeah. ready for reality. I'm ready for the <laughs> hammer, Dr. Mark. I'm ready for reality. <laughs> yes. Okay. <clears throat> The value proposition behind beverages is so compelling. Why? Why? Because most of what you're selling is water, which comes out of the tap, right? Mm -hmm. It's free, right? Okay? So most of what's in that cannabis beverage is water, okay? So the value proposition, and this is why it's a play to big beverage, is, okay, you ever try cleaning your bong out with water? It doesn't work too well, right? Cannabinoids aren't water soluble, right? So they have to be emulsified. And the fast acting things that Yaro is talking about is the nano, emulsif nano emulsification. So, so nano emulsification is something that, you know, the industry, uh, there's a few players out there that have figured it out. It's, it's, um, is it trivial to make a nano emulsion? It's trivial to make a nano emulsion of cannabis that tastes good, okay? It's maybe a little more of a challenge that has no background flavor whatsoever. But remember, in that, in that can of cannabis soda, right? It's mostly water, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 if you only have, um, I think the name, the number that you threw out there, Jamie, in the article was three milligrams. Are you fucking kidding me? Three milligrams is like point zero 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 eight percent. It's so below the hemp threshold that they could move that number up to like ten or fifteen, and it's still below that point three weight percent, right? But if you think about it, again, it's mostly water. So what else is in there? There's cannabinoids, and then there's this magic emulsion that basically makes the cannabinoids not only soluble, but makes them hopefully so they don't lose potency while the can is sitting on the shelf, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, so like Yarrow, we've talked a little bit about this, right? The, the, the capital intensity that beverage canning lines provide, or, or that beverage can, so the amount of capital that you need to make a cannabis beverage is the reason why big companies like Canopy and Constellation and, you know, playing to the strengths of the InBevs and the Budweiser's and the, you, you know, it, it is just capitally intensive because those cans, 
uh, are basically made to be put through these huge processes which cost a lot of money and they have to be pasteurized and everything that goes on there is just capital intensity so yeah it is a play for big money it's not like you can just oh i'm going to grow weed and i'm going to extract weed and oh, i'm going to make a beverage if you're going to make a beverage you're talking about especially because if you're taking that nano emulsion or you're taking some precursor and moving it to a canner, well, now that canner, who's probably canning local beverages for not only THC companies, but non-THC companies, they have to be cool with handling THC. I would think that certain canning operations might have a dedicated canning line for their customers that are making these THC beverages. Mm -hmm. But the big, deep-pocketed folks who can basically afford a canning line inside their cannabis production facility, now think of it this way. Oh, yeah, by the way, all hemp-derived beverages are using hemp-derived D9 that used to be CBD. None of that is THC that's extracted from hemp. Zero. It's all hemp derived d9 which is synthetic d9 that's that's not extracted from the plant it's made in a chemical reactor and and the reason why is because beverages like most cannabis products are existing in a commodity market proverbial race to the bottom right so in any commodity market a low cost supply is going to win all the time all the time, especially if it's spot on identical with what could be extracted from the plant. What could be extracted from the plant when you get that 10 milligrams of THC, it costs you an order of magnitude less to make that synthetically. So there's no question. There shouldn't be any question in anyone's mind. All hemp-derived THC that's in hemp-derived beverages is being made synthetically. And it ain't being made at the place that's canning the sodas, right? It's being made in, in hemp processors down south or wherever that basically have already plowed a lot of money into, uh, into their process and into their equipment. And they're looking to get a return on that, on, on that in investment. So, um, yeah, this is, for you. again, the, the, the shit show that basically has been brought to us by the, you know, the farm bill and brought to us by the fact that they still haven't figured out how to properly regulate CBD, let alone THC, out of the farm bill. And we could talk about the farm bill all we want, but the farm bill doesn't do jack fucking shit to what happens to CBD after it's been made into isolate, right? They can make CBD out of hemp, right? But now it's being chemically converted to THC. How does the farm bill affect that? That thing is so far removed from a hemp plant, it, 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 it's, it's just ridiculous. So holding out hope that somehow the hemp or the hemp-derived D9 game and all these other synthetic cannabinoids is going to be fixed by the next version of the farm bill, you're fucking dreaming. Hey. They're dreaming. And for you, Dr. Mark, um, the way it was described to me was if you extract vitamin C from a lemon and you extract vitamin C from an orange, the net result is you still have vitamin C. And my question to you is this. If you're talking about vitamin C, vitamin C is not is not extracted from oranges. Vitamin C is made by a bacteria that's been genetically engineered to spit out vitamin C. Right? That's not so, true. I once squeezed an orange so hard I just squeezed the vitamin C out of it. Oh my god! But the, but the subject matter is if they use that bacteria on an orange or a lemon. And the net result is they get the ascorbic acid, the vitamin C, whatever it is that comes out of it. Um, in in the relation where you're talking about delta nine isolate, um, whether it's synthetically manufactured from there's no CBD such thing. Or... There's no such thing as delta nine isolate. You can have THC A isolate, right, which is pure purified THCA, which is a white crystalline powder. You can 
you can decarboxylate that and turn it into what they call liquid diamonds. I like to call it liquid nails just because I can, right? <laughs> so you can take THC isolate, decarboxylate it and turn it into, but no one calls it THC isolate because you don't, it, it's usually a, a mixture. It's never isolate. Never, but but so it's it's highly pure if you're starting with THCA and you decarboxylate that, you're going to have pretty damn near close to 99% THC. Synthetically, you can do just about the same thing, and 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 the hemp hustlers have gotten sophisticated enough in their chemistry that they can basically do that convert. They can do that conversion chemistry and it still be basically spot on with what you extract from the plant. So what you're saying is then that what they extract from the plant in one versus the other, the, the final product is essentially the same. No, because of chirality well, and the way in which no, like go, no, go deep. No, 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 no. I'm the chemist. There's no issue about chirality, okay? But there are issues about non-natural um, uh, isomers that could be in there. But I can tell you, and again, I'm, I'm in this area right now, and I'm following up with a guy named Chris Padala at Proverde Labs, who basically has convinced me that they can distinguish between synthetic and plant-derived THC. But you got to remember, Jamie, when it's diluted down into that beverage, right? So like, like 10 milligrams in a 12-ounce beverage is 0.0028%. That is right at the ragged edge of what HPLC can detect. So they are so dilute that it's it's likely that if there are other byproducts in there from that synthetic THC, it won't be seen. So if that THC is anywhere between 80 to 85 percent and there could be 10 to 15 percent other stuff, at that concentration, you won't see the other stuff. The only thing you're going to see is D9. Yeah, the, uh, and I, you guys, I need to we, leave. We got to, yeah, we, we got to go to a commercial. We got we to go to a commercial. Okay. We're, we're way over time. Okay, on all well, this. bye. Thank you, everybody. We love you, Jamie. Thank you so much.